Denver fires back at the people running its now failed fund to help minority owned businesses. The city says they didn't properly account for millions in tax dollars. Three years after the King Super shooting, families are frustrated the case against the suspect is still stalled. Ken Buck quit Congress today and another Republican decided to do it along with him. Bike shop owners aren't happy about the state's new e-bike rebates because they get stuck paying the bill for them for more than a year. And superior insight from the students of Superior Elementary. Sometimes um, our life is full of bad news and hearing other people's good news and maybe can um, help you find your good news. I agree. So let's do it tonight on Next. The city of Denver says millions of dollars are not properly accounted for in Denver's entrepreneurship fund for women and minority owned businesses. That fund collapsed in a very public way this week when the venture capital firm running the operation sued the city for shutting down payments. Demifund founder Danielle Schutz says Denver owes her company $800,000, and she wants an audit of how Denver is spending marijuana tax revenue on economic development. Schutz's company sued on Wednesday morning. Tonight, the city tells Next they have not seen proper receipts for millions in spending from that fund. And the city thinks that the fund is improperly sitting on a million dollars cash that should have already gone out to minority and women-owned businesses. Schutz responded tonight saying that the city never had any problem with their documentation until last November when the city told her that funds had run out. The city, for its part, insists that there are millions of dollars available that have not been transferred to the entrepreneurship fund, but that money isn't moving until they get proof of how prior transfers have been spent. Today, we remember the 10 Coloradans killed in a senseless act of violence at the Boulder King Supers. It's been three years since a shooter opened fire inside and outside that store, and the community is still recovering and reflecting. Tonight, neighbors will gather for a town hall with local leaders and for a remembrance of those who were lost. Three years on, the suspected shooter has yet to go to trial. There's just been a string of competency hearings and court delays. The suspect is pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and is now being evaluated yet again by doctors. In 2021, a judge found that the suspect was not competent to stand trial, that he couldn't understand the proceedings or assist in his own defense. After two years of treatment at a state hospital, including forced medication, doctors determined he was competent. He then pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. That set off a fresh evaluation that's taken longer than anticipated. Family members of some of the victims tell us these delays are frustrating. Bob Olds is grieving his niece, Ricky, colorful and vibrant store manager. He says that the waiting makes it harder to process his family's loss. This is my last fight for my niece. This is my last stand for her. And I'm going to see this through. But it's super frustrating when you get a little bit of hope and that gets crushed. And then you move a little bit forward, more forward, and that gets crushed and you get pushed backwards. The suspect's Sandy evaluation should be finished in the next month or so. Then we'll learn if the trial stays on track for August. The suspect faces 111 separate charges, including 10 counts of first-degree murder. Today also marks one year since a shooting at Denver's East High School. A student shot and injured two deans during a weapons pat-down. It was the second shooting at East that year, and it focused community anger over safety and security in DPS, prompting the return of armed officers to campus and flipping the school board. School went on as normal today. The East community asked for privacy and a day of quiet reflection. Colorado's new e-bike credit is expected to be wildly popular, just like Denver's, except among the small businesses that the state is expecting to shoulder the cost of those $450 discounts until the government reimburses them next year. Here's Steve Staker. Colorado took Denver's lead, offering e-bike rebates last year to income-qualified people. The program was a success. So this year, Colorado decided to try something new, offering a $450 credit to everyone who buys a bike at a participating retailer starting on April 1st. The problem is participating retailers are going to be in a bit of a pickle. Normally, when you have a tax credit, you 
the the purchaser takes tax credit off of their taxes at the end of the year. Well, they're asking businesses, all of our small bicycle businesses, to bear that load. Nancy Fox just sold her e-bike shop in Buena Vista and is still advocating for bike businesses today. She says instead of offering people purchasing bikes a credit on their taxes next year, the state expects bike shops that participate in this program to sell the bikes for 450 bucks less for an entire year and then file for all of those credits in their next year's taxes, essentially making them wait over a year to get paid back and limiting their income. Margins on the bikes that people are most likely purchasing are between four and $450, maybe if we're lucky. On the website for the state's energy office, they acknowledge this quote, may present a hardship for bike shops and suggest loan programs to get those businesses through the year. Most of us are in debt anyway, especially when we start the season um, because we have hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in inventory. Nancy says opting out of a program that slashes prices on popular bikes will just turn customers away. There's so much competition that if they don't take it, they'll be out of business. It just upsets me that our government, who is supposedly business for business, is hurting a huge representation of small business in Colorado. In a statement, the state's energy office told us by next year, they should be able to pay out those rebates at least quarterly. And retailers who participate can take a $500 credit this year for each bike sold. It's 50 bucks more than the actual discount they offer at the register. They say they implemented this to get the rebates out to consumers sooner. But at the same point, you've got a lot of small businesses who are saying that's a lot of money for yeah. us to just kind of float to you for a year. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but when you describe this to me, I was gobsmacked by it. Like, the state is really expecting small businesses to just kind of, like, float the cost of their program for more than a year? So they are offering them loan programs through different lenders, but those still have interest rates attached to them. They say that $50, that extra $50 may exceed the amount of interest that you'd get charged on a loan. But at the same point, you got to think about this. This is These are small businesses, not a lot of cash at mm -hmm. hand. They're already getting ready for the spring season, right? So they've got to have a lot of inventory in stock. They already have debt from that. And then you add this on top of it. A lot of them are concerned. And there's also the concern that a lot of the bikes that are affordable, a lot of these retailers may move those off, off the line right now. To cover sell, their margins. While sell the larger bikes where yeah. they got the bigger margins and they might be able to float a little bit. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. Steve Sager, welcome back to Next. It's good to be here. The people will be excited to see you again. Thank you. Friday is a great day to quit your job. Actually, any day is a great day to quit your job if you hate your job, but especially Friday. You walk out that door, you never walk back in. And that's what Congressman Ken Buck did today. He quit. Buck's made it clear he wants no part of working in a Congress that can't accomplish anything. And he's frustrated with his Republican Party's descent into impeachment inquiries without any evidence and slavish devotion to Donald Trump. Now listen, Ken Buck is no moderate, but as the GOP turned away from conservatism and toward MAGA, that's when Buck started eyeing the exits. We need to deal with the, the important issues, as you've mentioned, uh, the, the spending, the, the situation in Ukraine, the border. Uh, we need to reach across the aisle. We need to find compromise. We need to move forward. Uh, you don't do that with people who are just throwing bombs. Buck's sudden resignation is timed in a way that's going to make it, it harder for Republicans to hold on to their majority. Because today, another Republican said he's out. Wisconsin's Mike Gallagher is dropping his resignation at a time that his state is going to stay vacant by Wisconsin law through the end of the year. Buck and Gallagher ghosting leaves Republicans with a one-vote majority. And that razor-thin majority is one thing that is keeping Congresswoman Lauren Boebert out of the special election to fill Buck's seat through the end of the year. This gets a little complicated, but you can follow this. So if Boebert were to win the special election at the end of June, she would have to vacate her current seat, and that would shrink the GOP majority even more. So now Boebert has to convince Republican primary voters to vote for her after they have voted for another Republican, somebody else, in the special election on the same day, June 25th. This week, Next viewers are helping asylum seekers in our community who have some of the strongest cases 
that they have fled credible violence in their home country and they should be able to stay here in the U.S. Families being assisted by a small nonprofit that works with immigration attorneys to find those strongest cases for asylum and surrounds those families with the support that they'll need to succeed. They have a 100% success rate in getting asylum when most cases are rejected. Since Wednesday, you've raised more than $10,000 to support the Colorado Hosting Asylum Network. Chan helps asylum seekers and their families build stable lives, especially in the first six months when they can't legally work because they're waiting on federal work permits. The nonprofit connects them with volunteers willing to share their homes. Or for larger families, Chan helps with the cost of rent. Often these are not families from Venezuela. That's who we've seen most often in town lately, but it tends to be families from Afghanistan or various places in Africa, sometimes Central and South America. The nonprofit surrounds these asylum seekers with support teams to guide them in every aspect of life in the U.S., creating a long-term relationship. And each case referred by an attorney who thinks that they're a lock for asylum. They keep families from falling out of compliance with the very strict rules. That's one reason why these cases succeed. And they can expand their program with what we raised tonight. So scan that QR code on your screen or text the word THANKS to 303-871-1491 to get that link to donate. And before we step away, I'd like us all to just pause and take a moment to remember the 10 lives lost in Boulder on this day three years ago. A mariachi musician in Pueblo is amazing audiences and winning awards, and also she's seven. Brian Wendland has her story. In a house bursting with music, Ready to rock and roll, Phoenix? Phoenix it? Benavidez rises with her violin and her voice. Do you remember the first song you ever sang? <laughs> These songs come naturally to Phoenix. My whole life can be mariachi. I love mariachi. And that's music to her parents' ears. We've been around Mexican folk music for a long time. As well as me playing music, we've been involved with folk dancing. Dad David Benavidez plays the trumpet. Mom Kayla strums the vihuela. We would uh, play the music for her when I was pregnant with her and after she was born. Supporting Phoenix as she begins to rack up recognition. And this one is Child Artist of the Year. This one is one of my favorites. Children's Instrumental Song of the Year. And I was the first one to get it. The awards are great, but this family is most proud of Phoenix carrying on a centuries-old tradition. I was the American that the country converted my family to. And I didn't know the history there. His daughter is immersed in that history through music. And for me, there's nothing more rich. It is, it, it goes that deep. So I always heard the music, danced to the music for all, for all my life since I was four. Four is the age Phoenix started playing. Yeah, ah. this was the, the first gig that she came out with us. The tiniest <laughs> mariachi. Yes. <laughs> Tiny but tenacious. <laughs> Phoenix is learning new instruments. It's a vihuela. And teaching the newest Benavidez the ropes. Maybe when she's two, she might learn and go in the professional. Might be excited. 
The mariachi career is just getting started, but Phoenix is ready for what's next. I feel excited for what's going to come up to me in the future. Un, dos, tres, un, dos, tres. A future surrounded by friends and family playing her favorite songs. Beautiful music. For next. I'm doing good on that one. I'm Brian yeah, Wendland. That's amazing. Phoenix and her mariachi Diamante will be up here next month playing MSU Denver's Viva Southwest Mariachi Festival. Crispy Donkey, I love that. That just makes you smile. A proud father and a talented young woman. You can see how she, uh, the, her father was just beaming. Yeah. Just beaming. The best. Oh, amazing. But meantime, today, temperatures. 60s, 70s for us on the Easter Place. I should say 50s, 60s for us on the Easter Place. About 5, 10 degrees cooler, and this time yesterday, 40s, 50s for us into the high country for those highs. Tomorrow, one more warm day before, well, we see some changes. It does turn a little breezy tomorrow afternoon. Clouds will increase, but this is the main story. Sunday, we see some showers. In fact, we're probably going to see some thunderstorms Sunday afternoon in around the Denver area, and then less than six hours later, get this, we're going to go from thunderstorms to snow, and that snow could be heavy at times. A few inches of snow looking pretty likely for us Sunday night into Monday morning with the potential for as much as, maybe even as much as uh, six inches of snow in parts of the metro area. Foothills, Palmer Divide, most favored to get some of that heavier snowfall. Downtown on north, mostly lighter amounts, but I think we're still going to be talking about some impacts to that Monday morning commute for most of the metro area. Seven-day forecast, well, this is the most March seven-day forecast for Denver. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, rain, snow, thunder, you got it all over the next seven days. It like shows that not everything is sad and you can, uh, uh, a lot of people can be happy. Yes, yes, yes. Normalize seeing happiness on the local TV news, not just the worst crap every day. Your good news is next. We share our Friday good news tradition with a certain fourth grade class at Superior Elementary. They like to do the same. So let's go to Allison Carpenter's classroom. My good news is I'm going skiing with a friend uh, during spring break. I'm excited to go spend some time with my friends. My grandma is coming over to see me. In two months, I'm going back to China to see my grandparents. My good news is that in a few days, I get to see my uncle and grandparents. My good news is I'm going to watch uh, March Madness. I'm going to watch... Um, March Madness. I get to watch March Madness with my family. I get to watch the Wisconsin Badgers play in March Madness. Have fun with my friends, family, and watch March Madness with my family. I'm going to see a basketball game with my dad. I get to watch a movie over the weekend. My good news is this weekend I should be able to scrimmage with some other teams playing baseball. I worked really hard on my test and I got a really good score. Uh, a spring break is going to be happening. I would say my good news is that I found out that my friend's coming back from Georgia this summer. I'm going to go skiing and... I'm going to go to Moab. On Sunday, I get to go camping with my mom and dad. I'll be getting a new house. And um, why I think it's important is because um, it's my first house in America. Yesterday, I threw a surprise party along with some of my other friends um, for my teacher's birthday. My good news is that I turned 30 yesterday. So it's a pretty big birthday. And these guys threw me a surprise party. So it was fantastic. <laughs> It's impossible not to smile, right? That's the point. We're back with your feedback next. Michael says, spring is in the air as I'm wearing a checkered sport coat. He says, so Kyle, check that pocket and tell us the last time you wore that nice sport coat. So I never wear this one and I checked the pocket today. It didn't even have a card in it, which means it could be a couple years since this has made it on air. Let's talk about quitting your job like Ken Buck did today. Mark writes, I was 43 when I walked out of my job. It was a glorious Friday, 18 years, three months, and 20 days ago. I have no regrets. None. Always a good day to quit a bad job.